this is a really about spiritual warfare, but I really feel like God wants me to just unpack some things here in the, in the few moments we've got today. And it says in Ephesians chapter 6, um, in a scripture that most of you know very well, it says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of world darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And I feel like, you know, even as God is starting to move, I feel like there's a real presence of God. You know, I had a, um, an email from Jeff, Jeff Lacey this week, and Jeff hasn't been coming. He's not able to get out. If he's, uh, the, the, he's in a, a home, a nursing home now. But he said he had this amazing dream. And he said, in this dream, he said, I saw our little church. He said there was hundreds and hundreds of people flowing out the door, going down the street. And he said, I just, I, he said, I don't know why though. We're all coming to our little tiny church. He said, and suddenly I woke up. And I wow, that's amazing. You know, he said, I don't know what it meant. He said, but our little tiny church and all these hundreds of people trying to get in. And I just feel like God is up to something so significant in this season. But the enemy is always aware when God is up to something, he tries to distract us. I did a message recently about the distractions the enemy does over our lives. You know, we do, we do battle against our flesh, but our, but our flesh is a process involved in the process of God. You know, our flesh is involved in this realm, but it's actually a supernatural realm. Have you ever, um, and those of you who do Facebook, you'd understand this. If you look for something on your computer and suddenly you're seeing ads on Facebook for the thing you've looked up, and it seems like the thing you've even talked about in the room or your thing you've thought about and suddenly you're seeing ads for it and you think, what's with that? And, you know, it's actually, if you, if you look at it, it's actually engineer, engineering. They use these bots to actually record information and it's quite... It's quite strategic, but it's actually quite frightening as well that they're able to take our innermost thoughts at times and suddenly we're, they're betrayed to us in, in that moment. And it seems kind of creepy, but that's actually how social networking is built, to listen to your thoughts, to your questions. And it's actually very similar to the realm of the spirit. You know, God is um, often described as omnipotent, means all-powerful. He's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. He's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at all times. And so that's the nature of God. And we sometimes attribute those characteristics to the devil. But that's not true. It seems he reads our thoughts, but he can't. He's a created being. He's not able to, to be in more than one place at the same time. He doesn't know everything and he is not all powerful. I want you to get that into your head. The enemy is a created being and he has been defeated. Yes, he's, he's crafty. The Bible says he's crafty. It says he, he roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but he, he is a creative, created being. He wants you to think that he knows your thoughts. He wants you to think that he's got it all and he's watching over you. But he is a fraudster. Yeah. The Bible says he's a liar and the father of lies. Yeah. You know, and there's a principle, friends, as we engage in the natural realm, the realm of the flesh, we become blinded to the nature of what the enemy's doing. And that's what I want to encourage you this morning. When the enemy comes to attack, be aware that this is the enemy trying to take advantage of my, of my human state. And I need to war in the realm of the spirit, not in the flesh. It's not your husband that the problem is the problem. He may seem like the problem or your wife might seem like the problem, but it's not. It's actually a supernatural realm that's trying to take you out. But he will use the flesh that's in us. Yeah. Who knows what I mean? Yeah. You know, the enemy wants to get you to deal through the flesh with words from others or even thoughts in our mind. You know, often our mouths are the greatest enemy we have. 
In Matthew chapter 12, it says, but I tell you that men will give account on that day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Wow. The things we speak are so important, guys. In Proverbs chapter 18, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. And then again in Matthew chapter 15, it said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. It's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And then in James chapter 1, it says, be quick to listen, be slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Can I encourage you? Your mouth is something that the scriptures are very clear that we need to learn to get mastery over. You know, one of my greatest strength is I'm a talker, but one of my greatest weaknesses is I'm a talker, <laughs> if that makes sense. God will use my very greatest strength in, in my, my greatest weakness. And it's, have you ever said something you feel like, oh, I just want to bring that back? God, put a guard around my heart. Keep my mouth in your ways. You know, principalities and powers in the heavenly places speaks about a spiritual realm where the enemy operates. And this, this isn't just the devil, but the, the demons that have been dispatched from heaven that are trying to deceive and dilute us. You know, his greatest victories are when we wrestle hand to hand in the realm of the flesh. And some of the greatest failures of the church over this last season have been as people wrestle with one another. You know, it's kind of scary when you see some of the stuff that's particularly going on in the American church between factions of, of political expedience. Some people believe in one political party and some believe in the other. Can I say neither political party is the kingdom of God. If the kingdom of God is a kingdom that, that will, will know no end, the Bible says. You know, our battles need seem to be flesh and blood, but they are not. And we need to see the source is not the natural, but the supernatural. And one of his greatest um, tactics is to remain hidden. If he can get us to fight a natural foe, he's won a major battle. You know, I believe this alone is the reason why so many Christians are in defeat. If he can get us to fight and to battle one another, to take swipes at people, he becomes the victor, you know. You know, we often go through many things and the real victory, the enemy is often that we don't associate the devil with what's gone on. And, you know, I, 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 you know, over the years as I've worked in disadvantage, worked with people out in the streets, and you realize their greatest enemy is their tongues. They get involved in situations and they say things to one another and it becomes such a difficult path for them, you know, learning to get mastery over that in their lives. Now, there's a number of levels, demonic levels in this passage that I want to just unpack for a few moments today. It says here, um, rulers, authorities, powers in this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And each of these represents a hierarchy, if you would, of Satan's kingdom. And Satan is, a, is very organized in his system of operation. He doesn't do it through pleasantness. He does it through control and manipulation. But the demons work in very, very practically in a realm trying to attack us. These, these demonic forces actually have order. And we need to recognize often we as Christians are so random. We have very little discipline in our lives. And those are the re very reason the enemy has, has success over us. The first of these, the King James translates principalities. And this word principalities is a powerful ruler or the rule of someone in authority. And the Greek word here is ache. And it refers to demon spirits of the highest rank. And the next level is of the King James translate powers. And the same word we see in other places in the, in the New Testament is this word exousia, which, which might, means like this, a superhuman potentate operating under delegated influence. You know, these, these spiritual powers are, are, have supernatural power. But can I say to you, 
greater is he that's within us than he that's within this world. The third level of the King James translates the Greek word com, cosmocrator. I probably said that wrong. But it bit implies a world ruler. It all, almost a picture, if you would, of Satan himself. And we can see that the devil's kingdom is not something that we can just dismiss. Oh, I don't worry about the devil. And I, I've heard people say that. But can I say we need to be very aware that the enemy does roam around like a roaring lion. He's constantly trying to take advantage of our weakness, take advantage of our sin, take advantage of our lower nature. You know, he has a strategy and a plan. And we, we need to only look at the television and the movies and all the things that are going on, how the occult and witchcraft have become so acceptable. You know, um, I'm just amazed how Harry Potter has be become such a prevalent thing in our city. You know, I, you know, there's a play in the city about Harry Potter and the cursed child. And it's like, it's like uh, this thing has been like a spirit of witchcraft that's been released over Victoria, you know, and, and witchcraft operates by taking human, taking human thought captive. And that whole witchcraft spirit is a very real thing. You know, it's on our, the televisions pretty much every week, they're playing these movies over and over and over again. I think one of the supermarkets is actually handing out chits from to children trying to, you know, and there's been such a a, a huge increase of children interested in the in that supernatural realm, taking going to find out about Satanism and witchcraft and stuff. You know, it's really a plan of the enemy to try and curse a generation, and we need to recognise that this is a supernatural war. You know, don't look to the world because the world will deceive you. The world will say, "Oh, don't look over here. It's okay. These are just they're just having a bit of fun." Can I say? As someone has moved in this realm quite a lot, this stuff is very real. I've, I've had young people live in my house that have been involved in, in witchcraft, and we've had to take them through a huge amount of deliverance. I remember once we had this guy who was involved in, who was involved in Satanism, and he had all this paraphernalia, and we took it down to our church. Uh, we had a bin out the back and we burnt a lot of his stuff, and the stuff that came out of the flames, or like, like literally, like all these these things, you know, spirits would come out of the flames as we were burning this stuff, you know, because it because witchcraft actually attracts spiritual powers. It's really real, friends, you know, this stuff is real. It's dece deceptive and it's demonic, but it's real. And we need to recognize when someone gets caught up in witchcraft, the very first thing that happens to them is they get full of fear because the enemy rules his kingdom with fear. But the that the Lord rules his with love. And the, the Bible tells us perfect love casts out all fear. And so when the enemy is involved, people get caught up in fear. If you get young people who open that door to that spirit realm, the first thing that happens is they're not able to sleep with the light off at night. Suddenly they become so full of fear and the enemy controls that environment with them. And friends, we have the authority over this realm. You know, don't be fooled. The enemy certainly has a plan and an agenda for this world, but praise God, so does the Lord. It has a, a plan, and he, we know how this book finishes. We know in the end the enemy will even bow his knee before, before the Lord, and he will say, Jesus is Lord. We know that. We know every person. We know all those things, but, but don't get distracted. Recognize that we are in a spiritual battle. So in verse 13, it says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when that day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, stand. Now, this word stand here could be better translated to withstand. And, and it involves the individual walk as a person, as a Christian. You know, Jesus was led into the desert for 40 days. When he was tempted of the devil. You know that story? And Paul also, after his conversion, was literally living in the desert for a time where he was tried and tested. And I believe every Christian 
goes through, at some point in their life, they go through a, a time, a day of evil, a time where things start to take authority over our life. Have we, you ever been in a place where you felt like all heaven, all the heavens have gone like brass? And God is testing the work of our spirit. And often he'll use the enemy to try and do that. And we'll go through a hard time. And I've been through seasons where, where it's like God is not listening. And it's like we just have to continue to do what God has told us to do. But what happens during those times is our spirit becomes fired. And we become like, like fired as in a kiln. And he allows the very life to be tested within each of us. You know, a pot that's fired doesn't leak. You take a beautiful pot and you pour liquid in it, it'll leak. But if you fire that pot, it'll actually make it sustainable. And if you're serious about God today, he wants to fire us and make us a vessel of honor. Amen? You know, the language used here in Ephesians seems to indicate that it's indeed a close hand-to-hand -hand combat with the powers of darkness. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. So a wrestling match is the picture that Paul is painting. And so putting on the armour is to be a constant thing. Many have suggested it's metamorphic, uh, you know, meta metaphorical or, or simply a picture of what we should do. But I believe that the more emphasis on literally taking the armour of God, the principles of his armour. Let's quickly have a look this morning. Stand firm there with a belt of truth around your waist, buckled around your waist, and the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, the, the Bible tells us the devil is a liar and a deceiver. In John 8, 44, we read that you are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he did not abide in the truth, for there's no truth in him. And Satan is a master liar. That's why we must close ourselves with truth. One of the devil's favorite pastimes is to accuse you. Has ever felt accused, anyone? Particularly falsely. You are too sinful. God is not the God of love. Your old nature is too strong for God. God will never deliver you from this predicament. Who's ever heard those words? That's the accuser of the brethren, trying to discourage you. But in Revelation chapter 12 says the devil, it says he's the accuser of the brethren. And Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and his ways are the only ways of truth. We need to see that the lies of the enemy, the accusations, the manipulations of the enemy will destroy us if we constantly listen to them. So the Lord wants us to put on a girdle of truth. I am what God says I am. I'm forgiven. I'm healed. I live in victory. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm a son of God. I'm seated in heavenly places with him. That's what God says about you. The truth is, I belong to God. The devil would have you to believe the lie that he said to me, surely you won't die. He'll say to you the truth. You need to take it, take it easy. You know, the enemy will come along. Just take it easy. God doesn't mind. Just relax. Put your feet up. Have a drink. Might make you feel better. You know, that's the lies of the enemy. The only truth that we have as believers is what God says in his word. We need to imbibe the logos of God's word, the truth of the word of God. So the lies of the enemy simply fall off our life. When he comes and accuses us, no, in Jesus' name. No, for greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. You know, the breastplate of righteousness is the word of God tells me that I am the righteousness of God. The enemy would have me to believe otherwise or more subtly cause me to rely on my own righteousness. You know, religion is about self-righteousness. If I, I can earn this, if I'm good enough, God will take me to heaven. No, it's never about it, your goodness. I cannot earn it. I don't deserve it. Even as Paul says, I am the chief of sinners, but he has made me righteous 
through the blood of the Lamb. You know, the main trouble with our own righteousness is that it is based on pride. And God hates pride. If you think you're good enough for God, then you are deceived. It's not your goodness. It's not how many times you've read the Bible. It's not how many times you go to church. You know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. You know, seriously, it's about it's about your relationship with the king, only by his righteousness. So I need to take upon myself his righteousness and recognize that in my flesh, I am nothing. When he sees me as a righteous son, it's not because of what I've done, because of what the blood of Jesus has done. Now, verse 15, it says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The Greek word here, and I'll finish in a moment, don't worry, is this verse, hedemosa, which can be rendered foundations. And the word is the same word used in John the Baptist. He was to hedemosa, the way of the Lord, which we have rendered make ready the way of the Lord. So we, to see it as a foundation fits into both these places in Scripture. John the Baptist was laying a foundation for the Lord. And here in Ephesians, we can render this, let's lay a foundation of the gospel of peace. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me a wise master builder, I've laid a foundation and another builds upon it. Let us, every man, take heed how he builds. Friends, the foundation is always the gospel. It's never some other thing. It's never some other plan. It's never some other theory. The enemy would have you to build on all sorts of fads and fancies, but the only thing that we can build on is the foundation of the gospel of peace, the foundation that we are, we are all that he says we are. So to shod our feet with the readiness of the gospel of peace is simply our foundations, our feet firmly planted, in the gospel. You know, it's easy in church to forget about the gospel. We get involved in church stuff, you know. It's all about the pews or the, I don't know, the carpet or something that goes on in church. That's one of the main reasons that the Lord told us to do this as often as you come together to do communion, to remind us of why we're there. We're there because of the blood. We're there because of what Jesus did. We're there because of what he did on that cross. And as he died, he said, it is finished. It was finished for you, friends. The rest of that scripture in 1 Corinthians says, if any man builds upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Wow. This is a heavy scripture. It's really saying everything that we build as Christians, everything will go through the fire. Everything will be passed through the fire of purity. Was it built for him? Was it built with the right motive? Was it built in, in the right place? Was, was the money that came in done for the right reason? And we might be able to do it and fool everyone else, but we can never fool God. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? Everything we build will pass through fire. And if it was built with the right motive, then it'll pass through into glory and it'll become substance. But if not, the Bible says we will get saved, but all that we built will pass away. But it's heavy, isn't it? In verse 16, it said, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Paul starts this verse in addition, or in, in the King James actually says above all, which tends to say that this is a priority. This is most important. The tense of this verse, this verb, sorry, also implies a constant unflinching attitude of faith. What's faith? Can someone tell me? No. Believing. Believing. What does scripture tell us? Faith is the yes, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
So to have faith is to take God at face value and to believe him. One of the greatest contemporary teachers was um, was Kenneth Hagen, and he had a basic basis of his ministry was Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you've received it, and it shall be yours. He based everything that he taught around that scripture because it was the principle. He was very sick. He was dying as a young man. He had a revelation of that scripture and he was completely healed by the power of God. So in essence, faith is believing what you pray for, trusting that God will do as he said he will do. So the shield of faith is simply knowing that the Lord will act on your behalf. The enemy we have seen is a liar. He comes to deceive. But if I have the truth of the word in my heart, my faith will sustain me. Isn't that powerful? Faith in him, not in me. I have, you know, I have problems when, when people have faith in all sorts of stuff, you know. We need to have our faith in the word of God and faith in him. You know, when I speak to the enemy, I speak with faith. When Jesus commanded the enemy to leave, he was ministering. He knew in his heart that the demon would, ex would obey. This is the shield of faith. When you speak to the enemy, say, get out in Jesus' name. You're believing. You're not hoping. You're knowing that the word of God in you, the authority of heaven is with you, and he must obey. Faith is not hope. The shield of faith will protect me from every dart of the enemy. He'll come along and say, hey, you're defeated. No, I'm not. I'm a son of God. You'll die. No, I won't. But no weapon formed. That's why we need the word of God to strengthen us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do you want to grow in faith? Let the word of God dwell in your heart. Let the word of God become all strength to you. For God's word will develop faith in your heart. You know, this word here is rima, not logos. And rima is the illumined word or, or the spoken word of God. And rima doesn't come from quoting the word over and over and over, but it comes as, as the word becomes yours. It becomes a, a word in season for you. And finally, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation which is, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of the Lord is designed to cover the mind. And friends, the mind is the battlefield most of us fail in. You know, he attacks us with flaming arrows. That's what the word of God says. And our mind in a place, and we're living in a day, especially where there's such powerful attack upon the minds of believers the stuff that is thrown at us from all sides will will lodge in our minds the, the sexual areas the flesh the appetites all attacks upon the mind of, of a believer but there's more a surreptitious attack upon the mind of a christian when an enemy can get you to think that you have truth beyond other people special revelation. This is why we have literally thousands of Christian cults today. People start to think, hey, God has called me to be special, all believing they're right, because they didn't watch out for the fiery darts. They come to attack our mind. You know, um, the Bible says our God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And our minds have a part to play when we think that God is speaking to our minds, we can really enter into deception. We need to be aware because the enemy roams around like a roaring lion. And pride is usually involved in that. When there's pride in our hearts, the enemy can engage with our pride and we can start to think, I have something really special. And can I say you can never see pride in yourself? I've had people that I think are really proud come up to me, you know, I thank God that I'm so humble and I'm thinking, really, really, praise God for that. If you say I have no pride, then you're deceived. Why do you think there's over 22,000 different denominations in America, you know? Every church started by some revelation, we're the truth. This is the Baptist church. We're the second Baptist church. We're the real Baptist church. We're the second most real Heavenly Baptist Church, you know, all in a line down the road. 
you know. Finally, the word of spirit, the word of, word of God. And this is the only part of the armor that's offensive. The rest is defensive, you know. It's, it's, it's to defend us. But we're only called to fight with weapons of the Lord. You know, when Jesus was led into the wilderness and he was led into the wilderness and he was tempted for 40 days, and I won't read that scripture, but, you know, what he did at the end of that 40 days, he came and the enemy tempted him. And he, he said, it is written. You know, when the enemy came and said, turn this bread into, into uh, sorry, this rock into bread. And he said, it is written. You shall, you know, I can't remember what he said, actually. <laughs> it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's right. And then, and then he tempted him again, and, and then he said, you know, you shall worship the Lord, Lord alone. And, you know, friends, we'll never overcome the enemy where, where it's saying, oh, you know, the Bible says something about this. No, it is written. That's why we need to get the word of God in our heart. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is sharp and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, joint and marrow you know the soul realm and the spirit realm is really hard to discern really hard what is soul what is spirit well the bible says the the scriptures the word of god will divide between those isn't that powerful so this is a very principle that will help you to overcome the enemy at every turn you know i over the years i've, I've um, had lots of kids live with me and i've had to learn to walk in that realm, you know, walk in the spirit realm. You know, we'd have kids that were living there with punching walls, punching holes in the walls and really angry. And I had to learn my authority in scripture. I had to learn to walk in the authority that God give, had given me, you know. And friends, there's power in the word of God and we need to hide it in, in our hearts. And finally, this scripture says in verse 18, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of repairs prayers and requests with this in mind be alert and keep on praying for all the saints and you know praying the spirit is praying obviously praying in, in tongues which is so powerful but i believe that paul's actually saying something more more than that he's actually talking about being in the spirit on the lord's day you know it says in the in the book of revelations john said i was in the spirit on the lord's day he wasn't in the tongues he was in the spirit realm and I think Paul's saying, you know, when you pray in that spirit place, you get into that realm where you have authority. You know, when, when you pray a lot, you start to recognize, hey, I'm in a realm right now. I'm in a place where heaven is hearing me, where God is, is, is got, I've got God's attention. And so the essence of this final exhortation, if you put on all the armor and you move in the spirit with a greater sense of ease, you'll be able to pray there in that place. Isn't that powerful? Okay, I need to close with prayer. So, Father, we just thank you this morning that you're teaching us to walk as sons and daughters of the Most High God. You're giving us authority over the realm of darkness. Lord, you've called us, Lord, to be more than conquerors through you. I thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And, Lord, we just recognize that you have a deign that we should overcome, Lord. And I just proclaim over this house that this place is covered over by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name. And everyone said...